there's a young man bringing this word that I'm just beside myself happy to see and have in this room. He is the real thing through and through. I've known him since the beginning of his walk with God, pretty much. Watch God raise him up from a young man searching for something real. And I saw him encounter God. I got to be an eyewitness of it. And now I've gotten to see God raise him up as this man of God, as he's working obviously right now in Florida, but we'll just see what God's doing. I want you to welcome, will you do that? Jacob Peterson, come on. Jacob, Jacob, Jacob. I love you, son. I love you, son. Come on. And y'all back him. Give him a big welcome to Cleveland. Come on. Give him a big welcome. Come on, can you give God some praise in the house tonight? Come on, if he's been faithful to you, come on, if he's brought you out of something, come on, if you're not the same person who you used to be, come on, if he's broke the chains of pornography off of your life, would you give him some praise? If he broke the chains of depression off of your life, would you give God some glory in the house tonight? Oh, come on, don't stop. Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Lord, you are good. Your mercy endures forever. In your presence is fullness of joy, 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 joy. Joy, come on, church. Hallelujah. Woo. Come on, if you would just keep playing right there. Man, I feel the anointing in the house tonight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I, I felt a couple of words I wanted to release before I got into to the message tonight. And Sam, during worship, as we were talking about the river, I felt the Lord show me in 2 Kings when Elisha was by the river with a company of prophets. I heard the Lord say, it is not by coincidence that the Lord drew you to Cleveland. It's because of the prophetic anointing on your life. And God's going to surround you with a company of prophets. I even saw this with, with, with individuals people who are called to ministry but they've even been hurt who's who's been burnt as elisha cut off the branch and dropped it in the river god's giving you a gift of wisdom to pull their tools back out of the water to give that back so stretch your hands towards sam and lauren if you're out here lauren might be doing something somewhere L lord we we just thank you father for this prophetic gifting on sam and lauren's life oh <laughs> lord i thank you that there's, there's the word of wisdom that you are giving him to help resurrect tools in people's lives. Lord, that, that the prophetic unction you are giving him will be used in this area, in this region, to raise up the sons of the prophets in Jesus' name. Lord, we even pray that. Begin to draw them from around the country to begin to come and to glean and to learn and to be trained and equipped. In Jesus' name. Could you give God some praise right there? Thank you, Holy Spirit. The next thing that I saw was over Lee University. And, and I feel, hallelujah, I, I saw Lee as, as a campus, and I felt the Lord say that the, the, the student body of Lee University is about to increase supernaturally, and they are not just coming for education, but they are coming for equipping. They are not just coming for education. They are coming for equipping. There, there are even prodigal sons and daughters around the nation who will come to Lee University kicking and screaming. But this is the place where they will encounter the presence of Jesus. They will encounter the presence of the Lord here in this region. And I saw that there, the Lord would begin to draw individuals from around the world to the university. Even as the, the Ethiopian servant in the book of Acts, the Bible says that Philip the evangelist began to run and overtake the chariot. And because the Lord has given this ministry a grace to run, he has enlarged our hearts so we can run this race. Listen, because the sign and the wonder that caused Ethiopian to catch his eye was the fact that Philip was running faster than the chariot. It was the pursuit of the chariot that turned his heart. Think about it. He's riding in a chariot, and this dude's just jogging beside him like, hey, what's up? What you reading? 
And he says, I'm reading the scriptures, but I don't understand them. And he says, well, let me tell you about it. And I feel like the, the, the uh, people from around the world who are riding in the chariot of the world, the, that literally this movement will have a grace to run fast, to overtake the chariot, see them get saved, get baptized on this property. Then they will get back into their chariot to go around the world to carry the message of the revival. So, so let's agree right here for that. Father, we agree right now. Oh, hallelujah. We thank you that now is the time for Cleveland. Now is the time for this region. Now is the time for Lee University. We thank you that there's been a divine reset on Lee University. That, that, the, that the intention, when it was built at the very beginning, it is going back to the original design. And Lord, we thank you that world changers are going to be raised up off of that campus. Prophets are going to be raised up off of that campus. Evangelists are going to be raised up off of that campus. For the glory of Jesus. In your name, God, we give you praise. And everyone said, amen, amen. You can be seated. Thank you guys for playing. Man, I am excited to be here. Our online audience watching, welcome. We're so glad you're here tonight. And click that share button. Let's get the word out there. How many of you guys agree God is doing something special and unique here at Ramp Cleveland? And the amazing thing is it's is, is only just begun. I remember um, me and my brother Heath, who's here. Heath, wave everybody. My dad's actually here tonight, too. Dad and my beautiful wife is here, too. Can you wave, Lexi? There she is. We're, she, we're having a baby next month, bless God. And what, if we were, uh, during the moment we were singing and prophesying about the river, I was like, let's name the baby River. And she was like, no. Because <laughs> yeah, out of your belly will flow rivers. She was like, no, we're not going to do that. I was like, okay. Uh, but uh, I remember uh, coming up here with Heath, and it was when we were in a little building right down the road. Me and Brian, and we were going there. Man, I'm telling you, Brian, we had some glorious times right down the road with Mark Casto, and, and it was just Holy Ghost. And I remember uh, Perry saying, God's given me a vision. We're gonna, I, I, I have, we have property right down the road. And then now to see God, what he has done, it is so amazing. And, and man, I'm, I'm just honored to be here tonight and share the word uh, with you. And um, let's just go for it. Aren't you just glad to be somewhere where you can just go in? Who knows what's going to happen? Who knows? We might have a COVID-friendly fire tunnel. I don't know. Well, you know, we'll, instead of oil, we'll have like Germex. Amen. <laughs> Or just stand six feet apart and you just, you know, we'll kind of do this number and you'll, yeah, I don't know. But, uh, man, I'm excited about what God's going to do. I, I, you know, I love when the Lord makes it easy. And uh, a couple weeks ago, I had a dream where uh, Samuel Bentley was introducing me to come preach. And he said, I want to invite Jacob to come up here and preach tonight. He's preaching from James chapter 4. So I woke up. I was like, thank you, Lord. Like, <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. So I have a, a very uh, unique word that I want to share with you that I pray encourages you, uh, that I pray edifies you, and, and that really I believe is going to set the tone because I feel that we hit a moment in worship right there where, where man, things were moving in the spirit realm. And, and things, angels and demons were moving in the spirit realm like Daniel when he's praying and fasting and, and supernatural things were happening that I believe that, that, that we really will not get the full effect until we step into eternity and see what happens in those moments. But I, I was reminded of Paul's writing in 1 Corinthians where, where he, he's writing and 1 Corinthians is coming to a close and he just simply says, let all those who do not love the Lord Jesus be accursed. Then he says, Maranatha, oh Lord, come. And I feel, we all feel this. I feel like more than ever, 2020 has pointed to us to realize, man, things are getting ready to wrap up. Can I get a witness? It was like, I remember the day after winter ramp, we like woke up and World War III almost broke out. You remember, that was this year, remember that? And the craziness and the intensity of this year has pointed to the fact that, that there are things being shaken, but the Bible has promised us that we have a kingdom that cannot be shaken. That even though there's a shaking going on in the earth right now in every nation, God has given us a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And I believe we are on the edge of the, of the greatest 
end time revival we have ever possibly dreamed of. I truly believe it with all my heart. But I felt the Lord say, before we can actually inherit it, we've got to get some things in order. Because it's the goodness of God not to let us inherit something prematurely. And I believe he is preparing us and getting us ready for a supernatural move of God. And before we do that, we've got to take care of what James chapter 4 talks about. And it is we've got to take care of the worldliness in our hearts. Worldliness. Just say worldliness. Smile at your neighbor and say worldliness. That's a hard thing to smile at your neighbor and talk about. Like Worldliness. I, I almost called this message tonight, let's just get weird. Amen. Let's just be weird. And, and I, I feel this charge tonight concerning this topic of being separate from the world, being different from the world that I feel the Lord wants to highlight. And, and, and because I know for me, you know, worldliness, I, I think in my mind, I've always viewed worldliness as this element of like, just purely sin. Like I, I don't do the, the sins the world do, do do's. <laughs> I don't do the sin the world do's. I don't, I don't do the sin the world does. I, you know, I might not drink, smoke, or cuss, you know, the, the, the three Southern sins. Like I don't drink, smoke, or cuss. I don't have a cigarette on game day. You know what I'm saying? Like, like I might not do those things, but so, so, so I'm not of the world, but I, the Lord began to reveal to me, the Lord began to show me that worldliness is a mindset. What does Romans 12 chapter number two say? Do not be conformed to the world, but what? Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And, and literally when we are worldly, that means that we have become adapted to the system of the world, to the patterns of the world. You might not be doing the, the, the sins that they do, but you might be thinking the way they think. You might be acting the way they act just with a Christian sticker slapped on it. And so I, I want to read James chapter four. And I love James because it's like, it should be called like the, the, the throat punch book because everything just hurts when you read James. Amen. And, and listen to what James says. <laughs> this is about to get so good. James four adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore he says, God Resist the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Then, then we can read a, a, another quick scripture on worldliness in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. It's very clear. Verse 15, it starts, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. And here we can find something very interesting when he, here we have two different writers in scripture, James and John, and both times they talk about worldliness, both times they charge their readers to, to separate themselves from the pattern of the world, both times it's immediately tied to affection. So you have James where he calls them adulterers. Then you have John who says, if you love the things of the world, the love of the Father is not inside of you. And that shows me this, that whenever we have a place in our heart to harbor the love for the world, we are hindering ourselves from loving God fully. That whenever we keep a little bit of love in our heart for the things of the world, that is actually a hindrance to us fully Loving God, being fully given to God. James paints this picture that's so interesting because he calls it adulterers. 
adulterers. And, and I can't help the, to, to imagine really the core message he's preaching right here. And it's this. It's imagine if your spouse was still best friends with their high school ex. <laughs> We're just friends, though. Who are you texting? Jimmy. We're just friends. How many relationships have been destroyed because they said we're just friends? <laughs> that is like the hashtag for how to destroy a relationship. You ain't just friends. You're catching feelings. We're just friends. Friends, we just go to the movies and we just talk and we met at Starbucks and had fun. He lessons to me. It's because they are seeking an element of fulfillment and satisfaction in someone else who, who they are not in covenant with. And, and I believe that the, the, the right response to a God who gave his only begotten son is wholehearted love and obedience. Why? Because the Bible says the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So when I am adapting to the customs of the world, I am walking against the grain of God's kingdom. And he's calling us to be separate He's calling us to be different. He does it in a few ways. I'm going to break these down real quick and then let's get weird. Amen. Amen. First John 2.16 tells us what's of the world. He breaks down what is of the world. And he says this is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So when we talk about lust of the flesh, what does that mean? The lust of the flesh. I believe that that is everything on the inside of us that is seeking comfort above the things of God. The, the, the Bible is very clear, even in Romans 8, that, that he who, who walks in the flesh does not walk in the spirit. He who is of the flesh cannot please God. Amen. And whenever, think about this, your flesh will always be hostile to the things of God. There will never be anything in your flesh that says, hey, you should go to that prayer meeting. Your flesh will never do that. Your flesh will always be against the things of God. That's why we are not called, as A.W. Tozer refers, to coddle the flesh. We are called to crucify it. We are called to show no mercy to the desires of the flesh because the desires of the flesh will get you into trouble. Flesh is like that friend you had in high school that always had you do dumb stuff. Amen. I had a friend like that in high school and I remember we'd be riding down the road and you know, he didn't have a car. I did. We'd be riding down the road and we'd pull up, we'd be going and there'd be some railroad tracks coming up and he'd be like, dude, jump them railroad tracks. And I'd be like, you know, I'd hear the Dukes of Hazzard horn. -da -na 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 -na. And I would jump them railroad tracks. Praise God I didn't die. He'd be the one that would say, hey, speed up. I'm going to hit this mailbox with your bat. And I'd do it. You know what I'm saying? And then I'd drop him off his house. He wouldn't give me gas money. That's the flesh. They get you into trouble and they don't give you gas money. Amen. Like, like the flesh is always, the flesh will always push you a further away from God. The flesh does not have your best interest in mind. Hey, just take another look. Hey, just go to that website. It's fine. It's just a glance. It, the, the, the lust of the flesh, listen, when we lean into the lust of the flesh, it will squelch our hunger for God. We can see it right here. So if, if the lust of the flesh is part of the world, then listen, the opposite, the flip coin of that is the desire of the spirit. It's hungering for the things of God. And whenever we find ourselves decreasing in hunger for God, it's because we begin to feast upon the things of the world and we're no longer hungry. It's like riding down the road and you seeing that neon sign that says hot and ready. Amen. Somebody just got touched back there. Testify. 
<laughs> tears streaming down their face. <laughs> you see that hot and ready sign and you're eating healthy, you're doing good, and your body says, go get one of them little gooey guys. <laughs> so warm. You know, you bite it and the, the, the um, glaze just flakes off all over you like a badge of honor. Like, like, just go get a dozen. That, that's your flesh is saying, you don't really need this, but it's going to feel really good when you get it. Can I tell you the truth? A donut has no nutritional value. <laughs> like for real. People be like, man, there's some protein. in it. No, there ain't no protein. <laughs> You could inject that thing with vitamin C. It's still going to kill you. You know, like, there's no nutritional value in a donut. There's nothing good for it in you. It's just going to taste really good. Amen. And, but your spirit is the one that says, a couple stops down is a smoothie place. Go get you a green smoothie. Not one of the ones that taste good. Get a green one. That's what your spirit is saying. Because your spirit knows what you really need. And it's interesting how when we give the flesh a greater voice than the spirit, we will always listen to the flesh more. And I've learned that the flesh is a very loud talker. I've learned that the flesh will speak loudly into your ear, but the spirit will only be a whisper. You'll be on Facebook and somebody will say something. And you're like, I am about to destroy your life. <laughs> and the spirit says, don't do it. The spirit, the spirit's like, hey, there's this thing called keep scrolling. They live in their mama's basement. Don't argue politics with someone who does not know anything about politics. Amen. <laughs> but rather, this flesh says, you're going to feel a lot better if you just call them a moron. Amen. You know, or, is, you know, you wake up in the morning and the flesh is like, hit the snooze button. And you're like, thank you. Yes, I receive rest. But you'll feel the tug of the Holy Ghost drawing you to get out and to seek his face. It's the lust of the flesh, the desire, the craving of the flesh. Second thing is the lust of the eyes. Now, I know everyone right here is like, you better talk about that lusting spirit. You better go lusting, lusting. That's how we say Lurston in Alabama. You better talk. He's going to talk about pornography right here. And I probably will. But I, I actually, I, I felt something a little bit different on this topic. Because um, I, I, I went back and I began to look at, I just did some Google searches. The average time we spend on our cell phones. Oh, this is going to hurt so bad. You know, God uses Apple once a week in my life. When he sends me my screen time reports, it's like, do you, know, you want to know how much of a loser you are? I'm like, man, oh, I thought I did better this week. And it's like, you were down 3%. I was like, yes, yes. Okay, listen to this, guys. This is crazy. The average person spends three hours and 15 minutes on their phone a day. I did a little bit of math. That's 50 days a year invested into this. 50 days. There's only 350, 65. I, I digress. I'll see you guys later. There's only 365 days a year. And 50 like, guys, we got to go to the chiropractor because our neck hurts so bad from looking down all the time. And I'm reminded of the psalmist 
Wait, he doesn't say, turn my eyes from looking at sinful things. He says, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things. And he follows that with, revive me in your ways. So that shows me what our gaze is set upon is in direct correlation to the amount of revival we will actually receive. What is your gaze set upon? And this, I had to, this had to be preached to me first because I was like, man, I, I find myself this, this literally this place where, it, it, you know, you, you leave your phone for a minute and you're like, you know, you're doing something, not having to think about it. And immediately I pull up my phone and go on Instagram. Immediately, you know, when, whenever I have any downtime, it's like we're constantly looking, looking, looking. And I feel the Lord is wanting to capture our gaze once again back to him. He said this, he said, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things. Psalm 27 verse 4, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that one thing I will seek, that I might gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and dwell in his temple all the days of my life. And I can't help but think that there is a moment where the Lord wants to unplug the matrix of the world and set us free from being locked in on a device all day long. Because I'm telling you, when we stop getting entertained by this, we'll start getting entertained by him when we stop looking down at this maybe we'll start sitting by the river like Ezekiel and he said I saw something coming in like a whirlwind and inside of the whirlwind was a creature I wonder if we would start having encounters like that I wonder if angels are waiting to speak to us but we're too busy looking down and the Lord is saying it's time for you to shift your gaze and look back up to me Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things. What would the world look like if we shifted that to gazing upon the beauty of the Lord? And I, and I say this, I read a book recently that really challenged me talking about praying without ceasing. And, and it talked about how you can carry the presence even when you're in your busiest task and the busiest part of your day. You can just constantly say, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Just, oh, I love you. I need you, Jesus. Man, I started doing that. I just, I'd hit a hard thing. I hit a hard moment. I said, God, I need your grace. I need you. I need you. What if we shifted gears? What if you downloaded an app on your phone that instead of looking at Instagram, you memorize scripture? You can do that. We can do that, guys. Like we can literally shift that. And I know the world says you need a social media account, but what if we didn't listen to the world? And listen, social media is awesome. We got a lot of people watching on social media online. I've shared something on my story earlier. I believe, though, we've got to, and rather than it controlling us, we got to learn how to discipline ourselves and put our foot down and say, no, 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 you're not going to control my life. The lust of the eyes. I got to keep seeing. My eyes need to be gratified, gratified, gratified. I, I believe God is raising up a generation that our gaze will be set on him and will only be satisfied in him. The last thing he, is that, that 1 John points out, he says, the pride of life. The pride of life. Now, this one's a little bit interesting. This one I had to really meditate on, really proud on, because it's like, Lord, what does that really mean? Does it mean just like being proud? Um, but, but he goes so far to say the pride of life, this element of, of boasting in, in material possessions. Uh, and, you know, I got, I, I got to thinking, I was, um, you know, I, I currently live in South Tampa, and I literally live three miles from Tom Brady. Three miles from Tom Brady. He currently lives in Derek Jeter's mansion that is stupid big. It's got his own zip code. I'm telling you, if I see that joker driving down the road, I'm going to T-bow him. T-bow, not T-bow him. I'm going to T-bone him. I'm going to like put him into the wall just so I can talk to him. But dude, I'm so sorry, man. Hey, what are you doing after this? <laughs> I'm sorry, I just slammed into the back. You, do you like pizza? You know, like... Do you like Krispy Kreme? There's one right up the road. Uh, but, but, you know, South Tampa, is, you know, we, we, we live in this neighborhood currently where, um, you know, it's like a lot of places. It's, you know, rentals are, you know, scarce and far in between. So we found this place in, in this neighborhood. And as you pull in this neighborhood, there are these massive homes, like huge homes. And I mean, like 
baller, like bougie. And, you know, my neighbor, Sam, he has a brand new Corvette, one of the nice ones, the new ones. You know what I'm talking about? Brand new Corvette. He's got a Porsche in the garage. Why? His wife drives a Mercedes SUV. And they have like this jacked up baller forerunner as well. I'm like, how can you, what do you need with all those cars, dude? Like, how do you pay taxes on them things? Like, are you the guy who invented Flex Seal? Like, who are you? Like, you know, <laughs> like, uh, who are you, dude? And, and, you know, and then you get to Lexi and I's house and we live in a two bedroom cottage in someone's backyard. <laughs> Well, I mean, I ain't complaining. It's a blessing. We enjoy it. But I, I've battled that before. To where I'm like, the house is huge. Like, what cartel are you a part of? <laughs> like, you work for Pablo Escobar? You know what I'm saying? Like, who, like, how do you, what do you do with a house that big? And... There's times where you see the things of the world. You know, that sports car flies by you on the interstate. You know, I, I, I drive a 2002 Jeep Liberty with an exhaust leak. It runs like a scalded dog. <laughs> they know when I get home. <laughs> they know when I leave the neighborhood. <laughs> you know? It's pistachio green. They know when I get there. <laughs> and they, you know, he gets in one of his sports cars and squills out. And the temptation would be to say, I want that. The temptation would be to say, whatever I got to do to get that, I'm going to do it. But can I tell you, I walk into that two bedroom house. And I got two beautiful baby girls that run up and give me a hug who's being trained in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I got a wife who loves me, who burns for Jesus. And I'm telling you, you can keep your houses. You can keep your cars. I'm a lot more wealthy than you are. I'm in the will of God. I'm burning for Jesus because though they might have the stuff, they might not have that thing that we have. Yes, they, they might have the house, but do they have your marriage? It is better to live on the corner of a house than to live with a contentious woman. I don't know where that proverb came out of. I never remember memorizing that one. But what does that say? It is better to have nothing with joy than to have everything and hate the person you're living with. It's better, listen man, these missionaries living overseas who have given their life to preach the gospel to unreached people groups, they do not envy us. And the temptation would be to say, I'm going to sell my calling. I'm going to trade my calling so I can keep up with the Joneses. I'm going to trade my calling and my purpose and my destiny so I can look like them and act like them and be like them and have great pride in my possessions. But I remember the story of the Bible that Jesus tells of the man that says, oh, I have enough food. Let's tear down these silos and build some more. Eat, drink, and be married. But he says, you fool, your soul is required of you tonight. And and, and I can't help but to think about, man, here we are being a part of a move of God, seeing lives transformed. And I wouldn't trade the moving of the Spirit for anything natural. I remember hearing this story of, uh, that John Piper writes in his book, Don't Waste Your Life. And he tells this story about, he tells a, a story about a couple a man and a woman who, who, who worked their entire life and they, require, they retire to Punta Gorda, Florida. And they move there and it says, and they were focused on in Reader's Digest. They did a whole article about them. It says that they lived their lives uh, collecting seashells. And so he, he tells their story. He, they, pretty much every day they wake up, they go for a walk, they collect seashells. Then it told a story about two widows whose their husbands passed away and they moved to Africa 
to be missionaries. And now they're traveling throughout Africa, preaching the word, serving the poor, serving the, some of the most broken places in the world. And it says one day that those widows were driving down a mountain in their van. There was a terrible accident and they both died. And he said, listen, when both of them stand before the Lord, which one is the greatest tragedy? Because one group of people, the widows are going to be able to stand in front of them and say, Lord, we gave everything for you. We moved. We gave our lives on the mission field serving you. We, we died with nothing to our names. We literally did everything in our power to win people for the kingdom. And the other people are going to stand there and say, Lord, look at my seashells. And I can tell you, one of the most terrifying things I can't even imagine is standing before God and trying to describe to him the square footage of your home. Or standing before God and telling him about the horsepower of your brand new Corvette. Are you living for the things that really matter? He says these three things are the things we have got to guard our hearts against. Worship team, you can go ahead and come on up. So, so here, here's, here's, where, here's where I want to land because honestly, I, I, with messages like this, it can be very easy to be like, okay, well, well what do I do? Like, do we need to become Amish? Come on, aren't you thankful you ain't Amish? Bless God. <laughs> Should be on your pr prayer report. <laughs> you know, they're great people. They make great butter, and I'm sure they're very nice. But you could have a neck beard right now. Amen. Your name could be Jedediah right now. <laughs> All your kids' names end with a Daya, you know? Am I saying that we now have to like turn our backs on everything and recluse into nothing and hide out until the Lord comes? Well, is that the answer that we, in order to be not of the world, we have to be physically distant from the world? I believe the answer is no. And Jesus actually gave us the answer. In John chapter 17, he said this. I love this. He's praying for the people. And he says this. Let me find it real quick. Here it is. He says, I have given them your word and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Listen to verse 15. I do not pray you should take them out of the world. I do not pray you take them out of the world but that you should keep them from the evil one. Listen to what he says after this. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your world is truth. Verse 18, as you have sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they may also be sanctified by the truth. The answer is not for us to leave the world. The answer for us is to be fully alive in the world. The answer is for us to be fully alive in the world. Because listen, in order to reach the world, we do not have to look like the world. We do not have to act like the world. We don't have to talk like the world. We don't have to partake in the same activities of the world. In order to reach a lost and dying world, all you have to be is fully alive. All you have to be is awakened by the power of the Holy Ghost. Because when you get awakened by God, I'm telling you, you begin to walk in something different. You begin to walk in something special. People begin to know something about you. We're in the middle of a pandemic. Why aren't you stressed out? Why aren't you worried? Why? Because I'm not of this kingdom. You know, my, my, my marriage is terrible and my kids are going crazy. Why do you have so much peace? Because I'm living according to the standards of a different kingdom. And as we begin to live our lives full of the joy of the Lord, full of the peace of of the Lord, full of the power of the Holy Ghost. I love the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, when he was poured out and tongues of fire began to rest upon each person, it was an automatic distinction between them and the world. Why? Because the world, the Gentiles began to gather at the door and say, what language are you speaking in? 
What is this thing about you? Why do you, when you come to church, when I go to church, I'm bored out of my mind. But when you go to church, you can't stop dancing. You can't stop shouting. There's some, when they sing about Jesus, you start crying. What is it about you? It's because I'm fully alive. And I feel we're in a moment right now where the Lord wants to break us away from the things of the world. He, his mighty right hand is wanting to reach down and pluck you from the things of the world. And even though the world is going one way, I believe God is raising up a new generation that says, I don't care what's going on. I am going to pay the price to go against the grain. I'm going to be separate. I'm going to be different. Come on, nobody understood prophets in the Bible. I'm going to be separate. I'm going to be different. I know everybody talks like that. I don't know if everybody gossips and slanders. I'm going to be different. I know everybody talks. I know everybody dresses like that, but I'm a woman of God. I'm not trying to be hot. I'm trying to be holy. So you can keep that. I'm going this way. I, I know I know. guys treat girls like this in the world, but that's not who I am. I'm going against the grain. And what you'll find is as you begin to go against the grain, sooner or later, you're going to turn around and the entire time you've been leading an awakening. You've been leading a movement. There's people in your behind who's in your path that you have led to the Lord and you did not even know it you've branded them by being the real deal is anybody ready tonight to go against the grain is anybody ready to be different is anybody ready to be separate is anybody ready to be holy even as he is holy is anybody ready to say god whatever it looks like whatever it sounds like whatever you have me do is anybody ready to say god put your anointing on my life make me separate fill me with the holy ghost i know you're gonna have me pray over people in starbucks but i'll do it I know you're going to have me prophesy to people, but I'll do it. I know you're going to have me wake up in the middle of the night and pray for a lost and dying world, but I'll do it. I'm not living for the world anymore. I'm choosing to live for him. Come on, jump up on your feet. Oh. Come on, wake us up. Wake us up. Wake us up. Wake us up. Come on, just begin to pray that. Wake us up. Lord, raise up a company of awakened ones. 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 Come on. If you say, I want to be a part of that company of awakened ones, I want you to come to the front right now. Lift both hands to the Lord. Oh, Lord, I want to be a part of the company of the awakened ones. Lord, fill us with your fire. Set us apart. Set us apart. Set us apart. Come on, you flying under the radar for too long. The Lord is saying it's time for you to stand out. You've flown under the radar for too long. The Lord is saying it's time for you to step up and to stand out in the name of Jesus. Oh. Come on. Lord, raise up prophets in this house. Lord, we ask God you would raise up prophets to America, prophets to this nation, prophets to this region. Before you were even formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. I sanctified you and I consecrated you to be a prophet to the nations. But, but Lord, I am only a youth. And the Lord replied and said, do not say, I am only a youth, for you shall go to whom I send you. Come on, lift your hands. There's the fire of the Holy Spirit setting you apart. Fire. Fire. Come on, receive your prayer language right now. Rabba, rabba, rabba. Come on. Tongues of fire. 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 Come on, keep going. Cry out, God, wake me up.
will be a resounding clarion call throughout the nation. Prophets of the Lord, wake up. You watching online, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up in Jesus' name. Settled for too long And now there's no more time to waste For though we've been asleep And you've been stirring us to wake And now our lives we give to this To see the coming of your glory Full of faith Full of faith we press on I've been praying this moment you would set us free from the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Come on. I, I felt this. I felt this in my spirit as I was getting earlier ready this week. If you got your phone on, you just lift it up in the air. We're going to break free from this right here. We're going to break free from it right here. If you have your phone, just lift it up. If, no, if it's at your seat, no worries. Just lift your hands. Lord, we declare today, turn our eyes from looking at worthless things. Come on, Lord, set our gaze on you. Lord, I declare right now the shifting of a generation's gaze are being pointed to the beautiful one. They're being pointed to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Lord, we declare a generation whose eye gates have been assaulted by pornography. Lord, you're raising up a generation of giant slayers. Lord, that they will carry the head of pornography in the name of Jesus. Lord, we declare freedom from looking at worthless things. And Lord, we declare right now our love for the things of the world, for things for brick and mortar, for clothing, for technology. Lord, we give that to you. Lord, I declare over you right now, you are officially set free from keeping up with the Joneses. You're officially set free from trying to impress your in-laws. You are officially set free from trying to look cool and satisfied by what you wear and what you drive. I declare your satisfaction only comes from being a beloved one of God. In Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray that in this room and watching online, you would find a group of people that is so dead to flesh. Even say this with me. Say, I give no room to the flesh. 
Say it again. I give no room to the flesh. I declare you are free from the flesh, that we crucify the things of the flesh in the name of Jesus. For those who have crucified the things of the flesh by the Holy Spirit, they are sons of God. We declare that today, Lord, that we will no longer pursue the things of the flesh, but only the things of the Spirit. Come on, put your hand on your stomach right now. Lord, I pray for God hunger to be released. Let it be released. Let it be released. Let it be released. Come on, let it stir on the inside of you. Hunger, 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 hunger. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after the things of righteousness. As the deer pants for streams of water, so am I. 